The Digital Preservation Network, remarks by James Hilton and Brenda Johnson at the 160th ARL membership meeting, convened by Pat Steele. Let me welcome you this morning. Um, I'm Pat Steele, Dean of Libraries at the University of Maryland, and I have the pleasure of recognizing your um, good judgment in coming to this conf and to this particular meeting because I think you're going to get some very good information about the background, the goals, and uh, conversation that's been going on for a number of months about the creation of the Digital Preservation Trust Network. I'm getting my two. See, we're trying to make differentiations among all of these things that are going on right now and the Digital Preservation Network, Deepin, um, is is coming at us fast and furiously and today the speakers that we have are James Hilton, who is the Vice President and Chief Information Officer at the University of Virginia, and um, Brenda Johnson, who is the Ruth Lilly Dean of Libraries at Indiana University. Both of them have been involved in pushing this and shaping this initiative from the very beginning, and um, there's a lot to share. I want to uh, start by framing a little bit. The part of the talk that I'm going to do is essentially the presentation that was done uh, for the AAU presidents uh, two weeks ago. I also, the other caveat is, I literally got back from France the day, two weeks in France the day before yesterday. I'm not really sure what time zone I'm in, uh, so I'm going to try not to be incoherent, but I uh, can't promise it. So uh, this is a presentation that was pitched for the AAU presidents. And as such, there are a couple of caveats that I need to make. Uh, one is that it is a pitch that is aimed at enrollment and a call to action, which means, among other things, that it's not high on subtlety, right? <laughs> so I know that all of these issues are incredibly complicated. I know that particularly in the library community, lots of work has been done on it. And the fact that all that work doesn't show up in the pitch is because it's an enrollment and an action talk. I used to teach intro psych. And one of the things about teaching intro psych is uh, you cover the, you know, you, you dabble on, on each of the different areas. And I would tell the graduate students from the different disciplines who were my TAs, because I had 1,200 students, so I had 30 TAs, and I would say, when I get to your part of psychology, you're going to wretch, because it's oversimplified, right? For what it's worth, when I get to my area of psychology, I want to wretch, because it's oversimplified. So, you know, I, I ask your indulgence. The other thing that I want to uh, just talk about a little bit is, uh, as, by way of background, is a little bit of the history of Deepin. So I would characterize my role in Deepin these days as the chief evangelist. But Deepin is, in fact, a growing collaboration, and Deepin has many architects. Deepin started really as a conversation between Karin Wittenborg and me when I, you know, when after I'd been at Virginia for about a year. Our president had a, 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 was leading a group that they asked, well, what about digital preservation? And we started with a small group of folks. We had some conversations, and that didn't lead to much of anything, but it planted the seeds that became deepen. And basically, Card and I have been expanding the conversation since then. Uh, and so, so it is a highly collaborative work. It's a, it's a work where the collaboration continues to grow. So, you know, Rick Luce has been involved in it. Susan Nutter's been involved in it. Mike Keller's been involved with, with it. Uh, 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 Paul Courant's been involved with it. Uh, early on from the beginning, a guy named John Evans, who's the co-founder of C-SPAN, uh, and has provided a lot of uh, tactical, uh, moral, and all other kinds of support has been involved in it. And today, there are more than 50 institutions that are involved in it. And I would say the architects are 50 institutions. So it's designed from the beginning to be highly collaborative. And uh, I'll just try to now go through. Uh, the other thing is, we're going to try to go through this. I'm going to try to go through my part really quickly. Um, Brenda's going to try to go through her part really quickly. And we're going to try to leave time for questions at the end. But if you are just can't stand it, there's a question that you got to ask. Go ahead and ask. Um, uh, I, 
My favorite uh, teacher evaluation that I ever uh, received uh, said, what could he do to improve the class? And the response was, breathe occasionally. <laughs> so I, I don't necessarily give the indication that it's okay to interrupt, but it's really okay to interrupt if you want. Uh, and again, uh, I'm really eager to have uh, all kinds of questions, uh, including questions of skepticism, doubt, and all those other things. Right? This is incredibly important. It's too important to screw up because we didn't want to actually ask hard questions. Okay, so uh, the problem today, and uh, you, you are an expert audience, so I'll sort of go through this part really quickly, but uh, remember this is a pitch that was for the presidents. And the pitch, by the way, was made by a combination of Michael McRobbie, me and Ann Wolford. Uh, McRobbie did not use slides. He talked about why the president should care about this. Uh, the part that you're going to see today are mostly my slides. Uh, Ann uh, did a brilliant job on describing why now is the time leveraging the progress that's been made in libraries and about the importance of collaboration with CIOs. Brenda's going to talk about uh, sort of that same kind of thing with a, with a little different slant. So here we go. So the problem is that the scholarship that's being produced today is at risk of being lost forever to future generations. Forever to future generations. And we're not talking boutique scholarship. We're not talking unusual stuff, we're talking everything. So it's true for traditional content. Why? Well, because among other things, digital books and journals require different and more active strategies to maintain. One of the great things about books is printed on high quality paper, stuck in a controlled environment with a couple of copies in different places to keep them safe, and you can pretty much ignore them for 500 years with a lot of confidence, right? Ignore bits for five years and you risk great peril. Right? So they require much more active uh, strategies to maintain. It's true for scholarship that's emerging in ways that we don't even understand what the product is. I mean, around text, we at least understand scholar from a scholarly perspective what it is. We've had 400 years to understand what the book is. And yeah, digital books are a little bit different, and that's a little bit of a twist, but mm, it doesn't break your mind to think that way. But the things that are emerging uh, with new forms of scholarship, New forms of, you know, for me, scholarship is about public communication. It is a dialogue that morphs across different content areas. Um, uh, new forms of scholarship, we don't even understand. How, how should we think about a project like Nines, which is essentially the home for Victor online home for Victorian literature criticism? How should we think about Twitter? If, a, if scholarship is an online public conversation, does that mean Twitter is now part of the scholarly record? Well, I don't know. It's pretty new, hadn't been around very long, but we're going to have to find ways to understand that. And it's true for data with a vengeance, right? Where the only two things that I would stipulate that we know about data is that the volumes are increasing. Um, I read an estimate yesterday that said that the volume of data uh, is expected to increase by 50% every year, which means it doubles every two years. The volume of recorded data doubles every two years. So we know it's increasing, and we know that the other thing that's increasing are the demands for access and preservation, the requirements. So I don't know if you've looked at data management plans right now. They're kind of a Rorschach. They won't be a Rorschach five and 10 years from now. They're going to get more and more explicit about not only providing access to the data now, but going into the future. And again, just as an example of what I mean by data, so the, uh, the LHCs, at CERN uh, produce 10 to 15 petabytes of data annually. It only runs six months a year, thank heavens, <clears throat> but uh, 13 petabytes on average per year. Much of the data that come out of these experiments will be thrown away. In fact, one of the big data management strategies is discerning what you want to keep, what you don't want to keep, right? Most of the data that's being produced is machine data intended for machines before it gets to humans, right? So much of it's going to be thrown away, but some of it you sure don't want to throw away. So the most recent supernova in our galaxy happened in 1604 and was viewed by Kepler and described by Kepler. It was uh, 13,000 light years away. The next closest supernova to happen happened in 1987, 400 years later, a mere 130,000, no, 163,000 light years away. Now, those data we want to keep forever. They are irreplaceable. 
So how do we do this? How are we going to discern this? How are we going to find strategies? All very hard. Not only is the scholarship at risk of being lost, but only universities can solve this problem. Only universities can solve this problem. And this was McRobbie's main theme uh, when he talked to the AAU presidents. Google's not going to solve it. Google may offer to solve it. Lots of companies are going to offer to solve it. But Google's not going to solve it. Elsevier's not going to solve it. right? And the reasons are multiple. Uh, one is uh, companies just don't have the life expectancy that universities have. So one of the points that uh, that Michael made to the presidents was he said, you know, uh, John Chambers, who's on, uh, who's who's a, an alum of Indiana, uh, said that when Cisco was founded, there were ten networking companies vying. Today, there are three of those companies left. Universities last for centuries. Our universities are young by European standards. We are aimed for centuries. The other thing is, is that we're the only ones who have the mission to preserve this for the sake of preservation. It is in our self-interest. We are the scholars who produce and, and, uh, and, and mine it. Uh, we're also charged by society for it. And one of my favorite uh, comments from Paul Courant, we are perfectly comfortable taking on businesses where we may not actually see where the profit line is. In fact, he once described universities as, we are a collection of businesses that each lose individually, and we make it up on the volume, right? <laughs> Which is kind of sort of true, right? If you look at what your research expenditures are, they don't actually make it. In-state student doesn't make it. We count on philanthropy and a few other things to sort of smooth the edges out. But the fact that there's not a quarterly profit in it doesn't surprise us, right? That's not good. One screen went out, but one still go up. Oh, now we're both good. <laughs> Never dull. OK. Uh, so only universities can do it. So what's the current state of play? Well, the current state of play, as you know better than anybody, is there's lots of activity. There are lots of repositories. Um, actually, there was a period in which, <laughs> please pay attention to that screen over there where we all, or that one, threw up repositories on an almost weekly basis, right? Everybody threw up their own repositories. Over time, uh, uh, one of the things that we started to see is aggregation, right? Because in fact, if you think about it, for most repositories, individual institutions doesn't make a lot of sense, right? There are great economies of scale in this space. Hadi Trust would be my poster child for aggregation, right? Hadi Trust was born because suddenly a bunch of institutions were going to catch a bunch of, of digital objects coming out of the Google Book Scanning Project. Rather than building them all separately, we went ahead and uh, built Hadi Trust together. We put it all there. We count on it, right? Aggregation. You see the same kinds of things in other areas. So you start to see uh, uh, aggregation around uh, other types of content. So for example, Shoah. So lots of digital collections with a smattering, growing amount of aggregation, driven largely by economics, <coughs> playing out across different content areas and object types, with most of the emphasis on current access and little more than promissory nods towards long-term preservation. Less true in the library community specifically, but a lot of this aggregation is happening outside the library. So if you are in big data, you are talking to the disciplines, not to the librarians often, right? Uh, and uh, so we'll give some examples of that here in a minute. And most importantly, all of these aggregation efforts susceptible to multiple single points of failure. Multiple single points of failure. And at this, so what do I mean by multiple single points of failure? Well, so you can have technical failure. Late 1800s, the rotunda, the library at the University of Virginia burned to the ground. Right? It's not a new problem, these technical failures. Right? So you can, have, you can have political failure. So the library at Alexandria is reborn with a heavy emphasis on digital. Whether it ultimately survives the, the in, end outcome of the Arab Spring is still unclear. Because today, that library is seen by some as both a, a sign of political corruption and it challenges world beliefs. 
its contents challenge world beliefs. So it's not clear whether it will uh, survive it. And then there's the failure of real funding effort, the most common failure we face. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is my poster child for this. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey has mapped more than 930,000 galaxies. It's taken eight years to collect the data. Uh, 2,000 articles have been written based on the data in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. 70,000 citations have been done for it. Right? It's an amazing resource. And it's data we want to keep forever. And there are efforts to preserve it. So Johns Hopkins and University of Chicago both have preservation efforts going on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Here's the problem. Those preservation efforts are funded through 2013. And almost certainly Sloan will come forward and fund it for another five years. But what happens if suddenly Sloan decides cancer is the real thing, not sky? Right? How do we organize around it? More importantly, how do we push the preservation envelope out beyond 2013 to say, oh, I don't know, 3013? Because these data we don't ever want to lose. Right? And this is the most common form of failure, a failure to find a sustainable, scalable solution. At this point, we reminded the presidents that we've seen this picture before. It looks incredibly like uh, the networking world looked like pre-Internet 2 before the Academy built its own high-speed research backbone to fuel discovery. And in fact, the tagline we used with the presidents was, in the same way that Internet 2 fuels discovery, Deepin needs to catch and preserve those discoveries. Right? They're flip sides to the same coin. So it's what networking looked like a lot before. So the sense of deja vu is the landscape today for digital preservation, there are lots of one-off solutions. There's emerging aggregation. There are multiple single points of failure. And the trajectory looks very much like the networking world look. Many layers to the problem. Networking is not just plugging it in. There's, there's hardware layers. There's addressing layers. There's software layers. There's identity layers. There's service layers on top of it. It is a many layered and complicated project problem. And it's constantly moving. Huge cost advantages accrue to scaled solutions. The one great lesson we've learned from this networked era is scale matters. Matters tremendously. Uh, while we can buy commercial services, it's not clear what we're getting. Everybody can slap a preservation logo on it, but whether you're in a format that'll last or whether the vendor will last, it's not clear. And we risk recreating the lock-in problem that we've seen around publishing, in the data space especially. And waiting only makes the problem harder and more expensive to solve. It's not like waiting is going to make it any easier or, is, or that there's a solution waiting out there in the wings. So we're either going to solve this problem institution by institution at great expense and with little chance of the solutions lasting, or we'll solve it together at scale just like we did for high performance networks. That was the essence of the pitch to the AAU presidents, but of course there's more. So just a quick thing about single points of failure. So how do you deal with single points of failure? So one of the things that Deepin's done is taken a lesson from the design of the information systems of the space shuttle. So when the space shuttle flew, its automated information systems, uh, NASA sent out a set of specs and awarded three contact tracks to three different vendors. And those vendors had to design to the same common specs. They could not share hardware. They could not share software. They could not share organizations. Right? They had to be different companies. And when the shuttle flew and it made decisions, at least two out of three of those, of those systems had to agree. The lesson Deepens takes from that is the key to long-term sustainability on the technical front is replicated diversity. Not just replicated diversity across geographic locations, which we all do, but replicated across the very things that you think that might cause single points of failure. And I'll talk about that here in just a second. So the goal is essentially to create, uh, starting with what I would call an, uh, an archive backbone, eliminating single points of failure by building in replication diversity from the beginning, and to create a sustainable framework at scale that evolves to adapt to new preservation opportunities and challenges. With me? Okay, so 
The proposal is create a federated, uh, federated digital preservation network, DEEPEN, owned by and for the academy, right? Just like high performance networking. To ensure that the objects and metadata of research and scholarship were replicated and preserved across, here's the diversity. You want diversity across software architectures. You want diversity across organizations. You want diversity across geographic regions. Again, this one most of us cover. Hadi Trust, for example, has replicated diversity across geographic regions, but not across software architectures and not across organizations, right? And you want replication ultimately across political environments. So, important point. Although the conversations about Deepin have been US-centric in the beginning, uh, that was, in fact, because we started with text and we started with copyright, and we went, oh my god, just put it on hold right now. Let's deal with what we can deal with in the United States where we understand the law, and then we'll worry about the rest of the world where the other laws change. The minute you get to data, right, so always the ambition to go away from being US-centric, the minute you get to data, you are in a global environment already. So although the list of deepened members and everything right now is US-centric, that's merely an indication of where we are in the startup process, not where it needs to go. Ensure sustainability and longevity by building a framework that can scale and evolve over time, formats, and organizations. Deepin is about building a complex adaptive system. It's not about a building a piece of software, right? Rigorously and continuously audit and verify succession capabilities, right? And we can talk more about what we mean by that if we need to handle that. So, it gets really fast now. So. Conceptually, what does it look like? Well, the Digital Preservation Network, conceptually, you basically have two kinds of things. You have these nodes out here. This is, right, the, the light blue, this is supposed to be a plane that cuts it, and these are all below it. We're still working on graphics. Um, uh, but uh, basically, this is what exists right now, where you have nodes that are starting to get aggregation. The idea was we would turn some of those into contributing nodes. Contributing nodes mean that they want to deposit their stuff into Deepin, which runs replicating nodes. Contributing nodes worry about access, they worry about what their content, what they're collecting, they're doing all the things that it's already doing. Deepin tries to leverage the activity that's going on right now, not replace it. So, in, so let's look at a couple of examples. So with text, it's really easy conceptually. And we're in conversation with folks. Uh, Stanford's agreed to run a replicating node. Uh, AP Trust, an organization that's being spun up right now uh, has contributed to run a replicating node on Fedora architecture, which is different from the architecture that SDR uses. Uh, and we're in conversations with Hadi Trust about whether Hadi Trust will run a replicating node. Right? The idea behind this would be contributing nodes bring their stuff in. In the case of Hadi Trust, it's the Google Books. In the case of AP Trust, it's much more likely to be electronic theses and dissertations, other kinds of things, not the Google Books. Again, we're not trying to go out and build another Hadi Trust. We want to leverage Hadi Trust and, and, uh, and uh, provide another level of insurance behind it, uh, not, not, not replace it. Um, so uh, with text, we could actually imagine pretty quickly bringing up a triad, right? The basic notion in Deepin is, you want things replicated in diversity, so you need a triad. Different architectures, different organizations, different geographic locations, meets all the requirements except for political so far. But we'll work on that. Remember, and that's because we started with text and went, eh, law is complicated, we'll start here. And then the logic would be just to roll out to other kinds of content areas. So in rich text, you could imagine you've got Showa. They've got to be running some kind of architecture. Don't know what it is yet. You've got C-SPAN. They're running, uh, their archives are, I know are at Purdue, beyond that, I don't know anything about it, but they're running an architecture. And again, you might, uh, some of uh, what the AP Trust may go into is also some video stuff. So again, you could create a triad based on content and large data. Conversations right now are going on with lots of folks about how we engage in data. So these are just purely hypothetical examples right now, but you know, you, the high energy physicists have an Atlas data management system. Well, what about, and in astronomy, you got the virtual observatory network. In earth sciences, you got data one. Can you start, and these are all, for the most part, focused on access, right? So can you have it engage them, the disciplines? Now you don't have to go out and take it back from them. You say, can we engage you, the disciplines, 
to make sure that your stuff gets replicated safely. And you, by the way, stay in complete control of your stuff, including access, unless, of course, you go out of business and there's some reason why it might be lost. And then the academy owns it. So part of the succession is about making sure that the succession of rights to decide, lighting up and stuff, uh, go forward in the event of failure. So Deepin's not a software project. It's an ecosystem. It's a complex adaptive system uh, designed to evolve to new forms of scholarship, changing demands, the evolution of software and technology. The one thing that we know is whatever software we build, this is an important point to remember too, whatever software is built to push Deepin version 1.0 out on, that won't be what we're running 10 years from now. And it will look like it sucks in comparison to what we're running 10 years from now. Just like the first network that Internet 2 ran out looks pathetic in hindsight. It's about evolving and growing, right? Deepin is a federation. It's not a monopoly. You wouldn't want to build a monopoly if you buy the logic of Deepin, right? Because that would, in fact, be a single point of failure. Deepin brings efficiency by leveraging the deep, diverse ecosystem that's already evolved, not by replacing it. And the primary functions of the Deepin Federation are to audit and verify, to provide grant-based and contract funding to the replicating nodes in a manner that ensures functional independence. So replicating nodes are much like an in Internet 2 contracts with Indiana University in this case to run their global knock. Deepin will contract with organizations to run the replicating node part. Won't replace the operating expenses that Hadi Trust has for what they're already doing, but the replicating part that comes on, the audit, verification, all that, Deepin will have to fund. Uh, uh, provide a legal framework for holding succession rights. Again, I sometimes compare Deepin to the Roach Motel. The idea is things check in, they don't check out, right? Short of a court order, right? <clears throat> uh, provide a structural orga an organization for aligning and leveraging preservation investment activities. Can we afford Deepin? Well, the first question is how much is Deepin going to cost? Don't know. Don't know, but a reasonable estimate might be $15 million a year as a starting place. What's that based on? Well, in scope, the ambition of Deepin is equal to the ambition of Internet 2. It's actually a more complicated problem, I would argue, than, than Internet 2. Uh, Internet 2 needed about $15 million a year when it first started out. Or another way to think about it is, well, you're going to have to get these suckers talking to each other, right? Each of those is a software project, sort of like a Kowali scale project. So you got three of them. Kowali scale projects typically burn $4 million a year in startup phase. So you're at $12 million right there, right? So $15 million as a ballpark at initial startup. Can we afford it? Remember, what you're affording is funding, verifying, migrating, holding succession rights, and paying for storage. Not on the slide, but paying for storage, the extra storage that replication requires. Can you afford it? Well, at $15 million, the annual costs at startup are five ten thousandths of a percent of the combined research annual research expenditures of the R1 institutions. It is chump change. It is rounding error, particularly given at what's at stake. Right? Um, and importantly, if you build deepen, you can start accessing other revenue streams. The feds won't pay for ongoing operations. The feds will invest one-time capital in new equipment all over the place. But then it's on you to fund its ongoing operation and replacement. Deepin embraces that. Deepin starts with the assumption that only the academy, in the end, is going to care enough about this to fund it for the long haul. So the pitch to the presidents was, we're going to have to pay for this, but if we go ahead and embrace that, we can then leverage these other funding opportunities instead of doing it the other way around. What we do now is we go for the funds, and then we say, oh, we promise we'll work out for long-term sustainability. Deepin tries to hit the sustainability from the front end, or at least aggressively embrace the notion that we own the problem. Right? So Deepin benefits. Preserve scholarship for future generations. Right? That's why you should want it. Uh, why, should you, why do you need it? Well, ensure that Deepin members have, act, have continued access to the scholarship of the academy in the event of one or more failures. That's an important point. Absent that point, what you have is a classic tragedy of the commons, prisoners, dilemma, common, right? It's a, it's a common public good problem, right? Internet, too, was easier in some ways because you could say to the presidents, man, if your scientists can't get to our networks, you're toast. Under this problem, preservation, it's so much a public good problem 
that, you know, the really smart thing to tell every president to do would be, well, just sit back and hope somebody else solves it because it's not going to come to burden your watch. Right? So this tries to actually make that a little more tangible. You want an insurance that's about risk management. It's about risk management for your institution. Evolve to include new forms of scholarship and data as they emerge, rationalize our collective investments and preservation efforts, and leverage diverse funding sources, create a framework against the which the academy can retool publication workflows for a digital world. Totally different talk, that's the core problem. We understand digital work, we faculty understand digital work, understand workflows in the analog world. They understand them so well that they're convinced that's the way God intended it to be, right? <laughs> or Darwin, depending on their preferences, right? <laughs> we don't have those for the digital workflow. It blows everything up. Peer review in an analog world makes perfect sense because peer review shows up every time you have to make a large economic investment. When the marginal cost of publishing in the digital world is zero, where does peer review show up in that, right? And peer review, by the way, isn't going to go away. It is. It is part of what it means to be an academic. But it's no longer buttressed in the digital world by the same kinds of th economic drivers that buttressed it in the analog world. Right? Uh, provide a way uh, of planning campus-based cyber infrastructure so that it efficiently feeds preservation efforts. So for example, at Virginia, what we're thinking about is central IT provides spinning disks, huge parking lots that faculty completely determine when the car goes in, what color it is, who gets to ride with it, how long it stays in the parking lot, all those other things. At some point, they move on. And they want to hand it over to oh, the library or to one of their disciplines for longer term curation. right? And some of that content at the academy level, we want to make sure is backed up forever. So it starts to provide a way of thinking about winnowing and funneling content. This is the list currently. We'll come back to this. How badly did I go over? And here we are, Brenda. Perfect. Thank you. Pressing the wrong one. All right. So here's my outline. I'm going to talk a little bit about Deepin, especially from a library perspective, why it might be right for your institution and give you some of the key considerations that you might consider. And then helping to, in an effort to try to help you think through those questions, give um, use Indiana University as a case study um, for why uh, you might consider Deepin. So why Deepin? What James said. Now I could have put the Mad Hatter up there had I known, but I didn't know. So obviously he just done a great job of defining the problem and the current state of play and the challenges that we face and therefore why we need Deepin. And he's talked about it as uh, uh, something that's by and for the academy, which it absolutely is. Um, but my perspective here is to talk a little bit from an academic library, an ARL library perspective. As James has already mentioned, we have done some things pretty well in terms of, for example, some of these existing library digital preservation models. We've done a pretty good job of geographic replication. Hadi Trust, he mentioned, replicated at both Michigan and Indiana. Chronopolis, three geographically distributed copies of the data at San Diego, Supercomputer Center, National Center for Atmospheric Research, and the University of Maryland. Publisher journal content, although we know there's imperfect uh, there are flaws in terms of the content and how much content we have in clocks and portico, clocks has the content stored around the world, China, Japan, Italy, UK, Canada, multiple sites in the United States. So we've done that. We understand that. We understand the need for geographic replication. Libraries uh, also, librarians, we know ARL libraries, we know, we've read that about 90% of the data in the world was created in the past two years. We get that. We understand that the data curation life cycle, starting with the creation of digital objects, the access, the use, the preservation, the storage, the reuse and transformation. And we really do get that there's a shortage of data scientists and curators. So recently we've been addressing some of those problems by creating, hoping to create uh, more of a workforce in the data curation area. Some of you might have heard yesterday the description of the uh, CLEAR DLF data curation fellowships that are recently being created with the assistance of the Sloan Foundation and the institutions who are participating. There are six of our colleagues um, 
who are currently recruiting for data curation fellows, fellows, Purdue, UCLA, Michigan, Indiana, McMaster, and Lehigh. Of course, Jim Mullins and his colleagues talked about the ARL eScience Institute and the efforts there. And there are many other things, that, as you see up there, the UK Digital Curation Center, the good work the Library of Congress has done, and NSF. But what are some of the things that uh, you might consider when you're thinking about whether or why you should be involved in Deepin? Well, I would say the first question should be what kinds of born digital data does your institution create? And here you should think of a whole variety of things, lecture casts, music and arts performances, science and social sciences data sets, specialty scientific instrument output, sequencers, telescopes, sensor networks. And then the next question needs to be how much of that data needs long-term digital preservation? And here I think I would encourage you to think about the uniqueness of the data. Can it be regenerated? And if so, at what cost? And can it be reused for new knowledge creation? Then I think you need to ask yourselves, what is your local capacity to hold that type of data? Are your purchases measured in terabytes or petabytes? Are you prepared for exabytes and zettabytes? And I understand the next term is yottabytes. And if you're anything like me, you thought it was from a Seinfeld skit. Uh, you could just picture Hey, someone going, hey, Jerry, how much storage do you need? I don't know, yada, yada, yada bytes. But apparently it actually means something. It means one septillion bytes or one quadrillion gigabytes. And we really are reaching that point where we can talk about yada bytes. Is your local data utility available across high-speed networks that enable mass data transfer? Is your data repository connected to the new internet to a 100 gigabyte network? Again, if you're anything like me, you probably don't know the answers to these questions. So we hope that you are talking to your IT folk. As James has said already, and he said to me, the places where the IT and the library work and collaborate effectively will be those that succeed and thrive. And as he also mentioned, we often have different perspectives in the library and our IT colleagues. And to them, scale matters every time, as he said to me. So we, can, we do need to be working together. And then the last question you might ask yourselves is, if you participate in something like Deepin, how could your local data curation and preservation resources be used more effectively? So here I'm just encouraging you to think about whether you could do more, which I'm sure you're already doing some of this, capturing arts, humanities, social sciences, and science content closer to the source or even directly from the experiment with more original provenance. Or we could think about libraries targeting digital collection specific content in a federated fashion like we're doing with some of our shared print repositories such as West or the CIC shared print repository or ACERL. So uh, Indiana asked itself very similar questions when we were pondering whether to participate in Deepin. Why is it important for IU to be a member of Deepin? What kinds of data do we produce and what does uh, IU want to preserve? What is the local infrastructure for storage at IU? And why does IU need Deepin to serve as a long-term preservation utility? Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some examples, and here I'm not trying to impress you with uh, the kind of data that IU has, but rather to uh, encourage you to think about uh, what I'm sure all of you have comparable sim similar kinds of data at your institution. But I'm trying to capture here a variety of different kinds of data that we all have at our institution. Big data is ex is exploring. Ex ex you know, exploding, exploring, whatever. It's exploding at IU. We all have digital library collections, and here we have digitized collections and photo collections and journals that we publish and video streaming. At IU's case, we've got about 40 terabytes in our digital library collections. That's the stuff that we tend to think of and, and know about. A couple of years ago, in fact, when Pat Steele was still at IU, the campus undertook a large media preservation survey and discovered that there are about three million uh, sound and moving image recordings and photos and documents um, from all over the campus, athletics department, Latin American Music Center, the Anthropology Department, etc., all have audio, video, film that need to be preserved and stored field recordings, athletic events, musical performances. 
we estimate that that represents about 10 petabytes of data. Uh, moving to something a little different along the lines of what, what James had mentioned, telescope kinds of uh, data. WIN stands for Wisconsin, Indiana, Yale, National Optical Astronomy Observatory. Um, the, their telescopes are located in Arizona, but the data is stored in Indiana. And each night, uh, they're capturing about 500 gigabytes uh, per night. So imagine how much data that is. Um, with the University of Illinois, Indiana has uh, launched the Hathi Trust Research Center, and we're estimating when that gets going that the derived data from uh, those coming from the Hathi Trust corpus will, in the initial 18 months, be about 500 terabytes. We're also involved with other institutions in a data net grant on sustainability data, another 100 terabytes. Genome analysis, petascale. And then there are things like, I recently met with faculty from the Center for the Study of Global Change, and they told me about a project called Muslim Voices. And it's an amazing, amazing website, blog, a whole variety of things. They capture videos and podcasts and exhibits and discussions. It's meant to be a dialogue to create understanding between Muslims and non-Muslims. I am certain they're not thinking about storage of that data, but it's important and we need to think about that sort of data as well. So then we ask ourselves, what kind of local infrastructure for storage do we have at IU? And actually, we were very well supported. We have a research file system that supports 48 terabytes, a scholarly data archive, 15 petabytes. But it doesn't take a math major to look at the things that are above the line, and those are just a few of the kinds of data that we have, and, and then look at the, in, the capacity for local infrastructure and realize uh, storage that we're, we don't have enough storage to, to support that. So this is just a picture of the Muslim Voices site that I mentioned. Um, so then uh, we also lastly said, okay, long-term network-centric data preservation such as Deepin, what does it enable us to do with our local data preservation resources? Here we're thinking about web crawling, capturing local content like state politics or cultural events, short-term web content like campus events, cultural events. Data capture at source with provenance, regional or collection specific content, and within our institutional data uh, publishing, including multimedia content for dissertations and articles. So those are just a few of the things that you might do uh, with your local resources if you're involved in Deepin. So lastly, for IU, another big deciding point was that our president, Michael McRobbie, was a former vice president for IT and a CIO. And I think James has already captured for you that in a recent Educause Review article that he reminded us that the IT marketplace is the opposite of long-term stability, that their strength is innovation, not stability. And he recalled for us that once dominant IT companies uh, that no longer exist include the likes of Sun, DEC, Compaq, Commodore, Atari, the list went on. This industry is not and should not be the long-term custodian of the data and knowledge of our universities. So you can see from that quote up here that he talks about researchers not always being very good at long-term preservation and curation of data. And then it, the question is who should be responsible for that? And of course, he is suggesting and saying it needs to be universities. Already mentioned by James, is this is a problem too large for just libraries to tackle. It's library centric, but not library exclusive. We need to have the presidents of our universities on board for many, many reasons, not the least of which is financial contribution. But we need their support to, and hopefully their understanding of what the issues are. So I'm hopeful that the AAU uh, meeting recently held. Uh, would help to, to advance their knowledge in that area. And next, I'm going to turn it back over to James. Okay, so we have just three more slides. So we have momentum right now. Uh, the meeting with the AAU presidents went, went uh, very well. Uh, we have a champion in Michael McRobbie. We have uh, a number of presidents who have already indicated that they're, uh, that they're interested in working on basically what we're asking AAU to help us with is to think about not just AAU, it's research intensive. AAU, to be clear, we went to AAU because it's a, it's a heavy concentration of research universities, right? It was a great way to get to a 
to a group of presidents. But ACE has already actually signed on to uh, help support Deepin. Uh, we're in conversations with APLU. Uh, in the end, it is going to be the research intensives. It's going to be your institutions that are going to carry this. Lots of, lots of institutions won't ever step up. Uh, it's not their mission. They're not positioned. So we asked the presidents to help us uh, figure out what the governance structure should be. One of the assumptions behind Deepin that it takes from the governance of Internet 2 is in the end, it is a very library-centric problem, much like Internet 2 is a CIO-centric problem. But the stewardship of that problem is a university problem. And the stewardship of that problem must rest with the presidents. And that was the, pit, that was the end of the pitch that we made to the AU presidents. Uh, Hunter and, uh, is John Vaughn here? Um, uh, Hunter and John Vaughn are going to be working uh, with us and Michael to identify a small working group of presidents. Uh, we're going to look at uh, different stru structures. Right now, Deepin is, is being sheltered out of Internet 2. They're handling the logistics, the auditing, the invoicing, all that kind of stuff. Not clear where the ultimate home is going to be for Deepin. It's not part of Internet 2 right now. It is a close alliance with Internet 2. We're going to actually look to the presidents to say, how should we do the robust governance? We, uh, Deepin was uh, featured, uh, I was in, edit, I was in France, but uh, Deepin was featured heavily at Internet 2. Three presidents or former presidents specifically talked about the importance of Deepin in the plenary session. So McRobbie talked about it. Mary Sue Coleman talked about it. Molly Broad talked about it. Um, we have momentum. We have 50 institutions shined up so far. Feel free to sign up if you want. Uh, uh, we have 50 institutions signed up. We have uh, capital. We have uh, uh, leads identified from institutions. There's going to be a deepened meeting on Friday that's going to really focus on uh, moving more towards operational and on this theme of momentum. Now is the moment. We have 18 months to show something. Or else Deepin will just be something that was remembered as a flash that went by and was forgotten, in my opinion. It's really easy to let this happen. It's really easy to decide that it's a really complicated problem and we got to figure out governance and we got to figure out technical and we got to figure out and we need another study or maybe five or six studies um, to really answer the problem. That is the way towards paralysis, I believe. Deepin needs to move with the notion that we're going to roll and evolve and we're going to have, the, we're going to have uh, the stewardship from the presidents and the engagement from the library community and, and the disciplines growing and we got to keep moving. Because once you lose momentum, you don't get it back. It's really hard to get it back. So my pitch is this is a moment in time. Uh, for uh, the Academy to solve this problem, right? Now and forever. Thank you for listening. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. For more talks from this meeting, please visit www.arl.org.